Right. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, this looks like a very nice workshop. Um, and uh, most of the things here won't seem necessarily directly related, but there will be a slide where I will mention kind of how it is more related. Um, and, um, or actually, I think very related. Uh, and there are, so in my talk, there are kind of three parts. I mean, the title has basically three parts. One is nearest number search. Two is that it's data dependent hashing using for nearest number search. And part three will be that it is optimal, actually. OK? Um, and uh, I shall mention that uh, this work is joined with Willi Rosenstein, who is at MIT. Okay. All right, so let me start from the beginning. Uh, since nobody defined nearest neighbor search so far, let me define it. Um, so this is a data structure question where we have a point set P uh, in a particular uh, under, say, Euclidean distance. Uh, we, will, we need to pre-process it so that we can answer the following types of queries. We're given a point query Q. Uh, we need to report the point P star, which is closest to the qu uh, query point Q. Okay? And, um, where this uh, shows up in applications, uh, this is a very classical way to do similarity search. You usually think about points as living in high, um, uh, in high dimensional spaces when, uh, when these points represent some kind of images or some kind of objects in general. For example, these are images from a classical data set called MNIST uh, uh, and, uh, of 100 uh, digits. And you can represent an image as a high dimensional, let's say, Hamming vector by, you know, if you have a 20 by 20 uh, image, then this will be a 400 dimensional uh, Hamming uh, vector. And then you can compare uh, the similarity between two images by computing the Hamming distance. Okay, and this is how you arrive at the nearest neighbor search problem. Uh, in particular, the nearest neighbor search will be um, you know, something called K nearest neighbor rule in machine learning for doing classification. Okay? And um, as such, it is, has many applications in many areas, in computer science and outside. Um, I shall not mention this too much here since this is theory audience. Um, so on the kind of uh, more on the Fear aside, I guess. Um, one can consider this problem as uh, under a number of distances, actually. Uh, so here, this is formulated under Hamming distance, but you can imagine kind of even more basic question is to think about this problem under Euclidean distance. But there are also many other distances, like eddy distance, which has been mentioned a few times today. Um, or f mover distance, which is kind of sometimes uh, used more commonly for images, for example, and many others. Okay, and we would like kind of you know, to design algorithms for, uh, generically for such uh, nearest neighbor search. Uh, and also, this problem is a core primitive for uh, many problems that show up in high dimensional geometry. Uh, a very classical example is closest pair problem, and we'll actually get to it a little bit later in the talk. Okay, but also clustering and many others. Okay, so this is a classical problem that uh, suffers from what is called course of dimensionality, namely, all the solutions degrade uh, rapidly with a dimension D. Uh, so just to start with kind of basic case of dimension equals two, uh, this is usually solved by a classical data st uh, uh, structure called Voronoi diagram, and then you do point location here, uh, and this will give you a relatively uh, efficient solution. And uh, one can, you know, think about a generalization of that in high dimensional space, and this will correspond to this basically row, uh, which it will get a nice query time, but the space will be exponential in D, uh, which is obviously too much space. Uh, and uh, basically, so this is one option what we can do for high dimensional spaces. The other option is basically not do anything, um, be lazy, and just at query time just scan through the database. Okay, so this is so this is what happens for high dimensionals for high dimension D. And uh, because of that, kind of now for a number of years, maybe about 20 years, uh, researchers have suggested the problem of approximate nearest neighbor search, um, where we have started getting better results. Okay, so let me define this uh, precisely. Um, so first of all, we'll look at uh, the, what is called our near neighbor. Think about this as kind of more threshold or decision version kind of. We're, uh, we're given a threshold R at the beginning, and now when we're given a query point Q, we need to report any point within uh, distance R. Okay, so pictorially kind of in, in, in color, so it is okay to report anything in this green ball, and uh, it is not okay to report anything in the red, uh, in the red outskirts. 
And now we introduce approximation. So the approximation will usually have letter C. Think about it as two. Uh, we'll introduce this bigger ball. Basically, we'll introduce this gray annulus. And now uh, what we are saying is that as long as there is some point in this green ball, it is OK to report either something in the green ball or in the gray outskirts, but not uh, sorry, in the gray uh, annulus, but not in the, gray, in the red outskirts. Okay. Put differently, kind of, if you you know, if you think more like a promise problem, if the data set is such that there is nothing in this uh, gray annulus, then the exact and approximate versions are exactly the same problem under this promise. And in practice, this is uh, even these approximate the solutions for approximate nearest neighbor search are often used for uh, solving the exact nearest neighbor search as a as a heuristic, uh, basically, or as a filtering step. You can think about these algorithms usually reporting a list of points, which is in this gray ball, perhaps some of the points in this uh, gray annulus, and basically you can do post filtering uh, after such a solution and throw out all the points that you don't like, for example. Okay, so. So this is uh, so this is the definition of approximate nearest neighbor. Other questions so far? Good. Um, and um, so uh, there has been a lot of progress on it, and uh, there are basically two types of solutions uh, that uh, the community has seen. One is which uh, got a dependence on dimension which is exp still exponential, but better than before, something like one over epsilon to the d as opposed to n to the d. And the other one, which really got kind of linear or maybe polynomial dependence on dimension, and this is really the regime that I'll be focusing in on. Okay, so uh, so essentially, you know, all except you know the work uh, that I'll be mentioning are based on the notion of locality sensitive hashing. Um, uh, and uh, this is a notion introduced by Nick Matwani back in 1998, and it is basically a random hash function on a geometric space. This is this is what is what is the concept is, and um, kind of geometrically you can think a random hash function on a geometric space as a basic as a random space partition. Okay, so each part will correspond to all the points that uh, hashed the same hash code. Okay, it's exactly the same bucket, and. Um, now we want this hash function to be useful somehow, so we want more properties of it. And the two properties that we want are uh, basically for, you, you can think about for points that are close, basically the points which are in this gray ball, and the points that are far, the points that are in the, in the red outskirts. And in particular, we want that for close pairs, uh, these, pair, these uh, points are usually in the same bucket, so the probability of collision is high. And the, for pairs of points that are far, with, for example, for this point, we want this probability of collision to be small. Okay, so you know we, we are still to des design this hash function, but suppose we manage to design a hash function which is super efficient. Let's say this high is really one, this small is let's say zero. Um, so then the solution would be just to do a, a hash table, to just construct a hash table. So for this data set, you'll just build a hash table, hash using this hash function h. And then during a query time, you just look up the bucket. And uh, these two properties will guarantee that the points that you find in this bucket are exactly the points that you uh, want to find. OK? Now, designing such a hash function you know, sounds too good. Uh, this is too ambitious. Um, I mean, we, we need to lower our ambition a little bit, uh, but not too, too far. Um, so it is possible to design hash functions, which will achieve perhaps not a very big gap, but some gap, and we'll exploit that gap. Okay, so as long as there is some gap between these probabilities, we can, we can design efficient nearest number search. And uh, pictorially, kind of, you can think about these uh, probabilities of collision as some decaying function as a function of the distance between two points. Okay? And uh, now, you know, since this probability is not so small, this means that perhaps in one hash table we will not find one, uh, the near neighbor that we are looking for, so we'll need to use several hash tables. Okay? So this means that we'll do a few of these space partitions, build a few hash tables, uh, and query all of these hash tables. Okay? Now, the remaining part kind of what remains is, okay, how many hash tables do we need? And uh, the number of hash tables is uh, basically dependent on these two probabilities, of course. And uh, if we call this P1, and the bigger probability, P2, the smaller probability, then the number, the number of hash tables is basically is dominated by, um, uh, is determined by this uh, parameter rho. So basically our query time will be n to power rho. 
and uh, this row is a function of p1 and p2. Okay, so I won't describe why it is like that. It is not too hard to deduce it, but it is always a constant between zero and one. And uh, you shall think about this as the better approximation, the higher approximation we desire, the smaller row will be. Okay, so it will be generally decaying with approximation. The problem will become easier. Okay, so um, so this is the scheme. I mean, we are still to. I won't describe the hash functions in this particular case, but we will see some construction a little bit later. So, uh, so what do we know about LSH algorithms? Uh, so the original paper uh, showed uh, a scheme for the Hamming space, uh, and it obtained exponent row, which is one over C. And I'll just have a running uh, example of approximation sequels too, uh, just for concreteness. Uh, so here we get row equals a half, uh, so later, so uh, this uh, this work actually applied for Euclidean space as well by standard uh, reductions, um, and uh, later with uh, Piotr Rinding in 2006, we proved that you can actually in Euclidean space you can get better space partitions, and in particular, say for approximation two, you can reduce query time from root n to fourth root of n. Okay. So then the question is, okay, can we do even further? And actually, just a few months kind of uh, after that paper, uh, researchers have shown that you can actually, you can prove lower bounds for LSH. So these are related to certain kind of isoperimetric inequalities, and you can prove lower bounds. And in particular, so this was first in a paper by Matwani, Nawar, and Panigrahi, and uh, later in the O'Donnell, Wu, and Zhu, showed that these two bounds are actually optimal for locality sensitive hashing. Okay, so we cannot improve using LSH. Okay, so you know, kind of think about that. Basically, you know, we don't really have kind of other techniques, or at least at that moment. Uh, so basically, LSH is tight. You know, so what does it mean? Are we really done with the basic nearest neighbor search algorithms, or is there something else? Okay, so hold on to that thought and let's do a detour um, for the moment. So the two detour will talk about the closest pair problem. Okay. Uh, so let me define it exactly. Um, so let me defi de uh, define the bichromatic version, let's say, in the Hamming space. So you are given, uh, let's say, a blue set and a red set of points. We need to find a pair of points which are a distance at most r, let's say, assuming that there is a pair of distance r. Okay, again, there is, or if you want, it's a promise problem, there is no pair of points in, in, in between these two bounds, so then we need to report the, the points within distance r. Okay, so, and uh, let's say for this slide, uh, think about approximation C as being one plus epsilon. So, uh, so basically using the local sensitive hashing, um, or hashing in particular, one can uh, obtain times which are of the sort of two to minus a constant times epsilon. Okay, and the idea is the algorithm is simple. You'll basically preprocess pre A uh, as a data structure, and then you do a query on each point in B. Okay, and um, basically, the, if you get the number of hash tables n to power rho, your your runtime for closest pair will be n to one plus rho. And basically, replacing C equals one plus epsilon, these are the runtimes that you'll get. Okay, so recently there has been. So this was the case kind of for a number of years, and as of recently, there has been more progress on this problem that started utilizing matrix multiplication to get faster algorithms. So in particular, uh, in work of Alman and Williams, uh, they showed that you can solve exact closest pairs, so you know, think of epsilon as being uh, zero, as long as dimension is basically proportional to log n. So you can get you know, truly subquadratic time as long as dimension is basically log n times a constant. Okay, and there is a relation between this constant and this constant. Okay. In another line of work, uh, initiated by Greg Valiant, and then uh, recently improved by Karpa, Kaski, uh, and Kohonen, um, they showed that they considered uh, the average case uh, uh, for this problem. And um, it's also called light bulb problem, and it has been studied before. Um, but here they showed that for this average case, you can get, uh, again, essentially a truly subquadratic time um, for dimensions sufficiently large. And for, let's say, epsilon fixed as a constant, let's say. Let me see exactly what is the average case, since we'll need it later. So think about this as your points are 
fully random in two-dimensional space. And when you also pair, you, uh, you plant a pair of points at distance basically d by half divided by c. Right, so your random two random points will be a distance d by two roughly, uh, and you'll plant a pair which is a distance c less than the average. Okay, so this is the kind of the average case. So this is the runtimes that, that is possible to get again uh, better than uh, much better than this time, and um, uh, so Greg also thought about uh, how if if we can uh, um, extend this to the worst case. And basically, the best bound that uh, Greg Valen got was two to minus theta root epsilon. So this is, I mean, this is a better dependence on epsilon. Uh, but again, as epsilon goes to zero, this goes to quadratic time. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, basically, the conclusion of this, uh, you know, to remember kind of a rest is that one can get much more efficient algorithms for closest pair. As long as dimension, let's say, is order log n, or if uh, you consider the average case. Okay. And um, I guess closest pair kind of is a classical problem. Many other people mention the connection to Ceph and so forth. So this is not the point of this talk, but um, I thought it'd be nice to mention these connections. Okay. So, so okay. So this was the detour going back to nearest neighbor search. So. So back to nearest neighbor search. So it turns out that we can go beyond locally sensitive hashing and get better algorithms for nearest neighbor search. Okay. So let me tell you first how the results look like, and then I'll tell you how one gets around the locally sensitive hashing lower bounds. So so this is the type. This is what has been proven for LSH. Say for Hamming space, exponent is uh, rho one over c. Uh, so in uh, joint work with Piotr Indyk, uh, Huang Wen, and Ilya Rosenstein in 2014, we showed that you can get rho which is a little bit less than half minus epsilon for approximation two. Okay, so exact exponent is a little bit more complicated to write down. Um, also in part because basically in this work with Ilya Rosenstein, we showed that you can get rho which is equal to one over two c minus one, or to be uh, specific for approximation two, this goes to exponent which is n to a third. Okay. Exactly the same improvement is possible for Euclidean space as well. So one gets from, uh, let's say, exponent a quarter to exponent one over seven. Okay. For larger C, this is basically a quadratic time improvement. Okay. And basically, I'll be focusing on this algorithm, and I pretty much will be showing this algorithm in this talk. Okay. Other uh, questions so far? Okay, so the question should be, how do we get around the lower bound for LSH? And, um, and the real kind of, you know, the idea was in the title, well, the idea is to use data-dependent hashing. So what is data-dependent hashing? So think about this, we are still using a random hash function to partition the space, except that that hash function is chosen after we have seen the data set. Okay, so it can adapt to the actual data set uh, that we see. Now, uh, so if this is all I've told you, kind of, if this is the goal, you're given a data set, now you have to design a random hash function that partition space well for nearest neighbor search, what should be the, the hash function? Verona diagram. Precisely, Verona diagram, right? This is, the best, this is the best space partition for a given data set, right? Now, something is wrong because we're back to the Verona diagram. And the problem is that computing this hash function is, is inefficient. Right? It takes a lot of time linear with the data set. So what we really want, we want a hash function which depends, depends on the data set, has nicer properties, but is also efficiently computable. So we, we rule out Verona diagram. Okay, so this will be the goal. Okay, so, and this is what we'll see later uh, in the talk. Now, before kind of going further, you know, since there are many people kind of more on complexity side, let me kind of tell you why the lower bound for LSH does not exactly transfer to a lower bound for nearest neighbor search. Okay, so the LSH lower bounds kind of for both cases for Hamming and for Euclidean proceed uh, by you know, proving lower bound is Hamming space and they're basically for analytic isoparametric inequalities, pretty much. And the first one was shown by Matwan in our panigraphy 2006. Uh, six. 
and uh, the proof kind of goes in the following way. You kind of assume any distribution h, big H over your hash functions into a discrete universe. And then you're designing kind of the hard instance as uh, saying that let's consider a far, pains, a far pair of points as being PQ completely random, in which case there are distance d by 2, roughly. The closed pair is uh, PQ, which are random, but conditioned to be a distance d by 2 divided by C. Right? So C factor, factor C closer. And for this hard distribution, for any distribution H of hash functions, we show that rho has to be essentially at least half by C. OK? So then came, uh, OK, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention, but note that this is basically corresponds uh, a lot to the average case considered in the closest pair problem. OK. So then comes O'Donnell, Wu, and Zhu uh, five years later. And they say, like, well, this is not the best, uh, the best setting of parameters for proving a lower bound. They said that, well, if we take actually the far pair to be correlated as well, to be correlated to be a distance delta times d. For delta, think about it's very small. Closed pair is by factor c smaller. In that case, you can prove rho, which is essentially tight LSH bound, 1 over c. OK, so this is not the distribution anymore. Okay, so now the question is, okay, you know, can this type of lower bound, this kind of hard distribution, can it be generalized to a nearest neighbor search? Can it lead to a nearest neighbor search lower bound? And the answer is basically no. And here is the reason. Um, so you pick a random Q, let's say. So the far points, so then you say that, well, I'll generate a lot of far points that, you know, should be bad for LSH. Now, all these far points are correlated with our point Q. Right, we are all within in a small ball of radius, basically some epsilon d. Okay, and if you if you if you can preprocess this situation, then you you can detect the structure. You can see that your data set has additional structure, and maybe you can exploit it. Okay, and this is exactly what the algorithms will do. We will be able to exploit this kind of structure and basically avoid these kind of lower bounds. Okay, so let me go into the actual construction. So actual algorithm now. Uh, so there are two components, right? So coming back kind of to the average case description, so component number one shows that if your point set is essentially average case point set, which I'll define more formally on the next slide, then you can actually design better data independent space partitions. Okay? So think about this. If your data has more structure, then you can do even better space partitions. Okay? So this is part one. Part two says that any worst case data set can be reduced to this nice data structure. And this is the part that will be data dependent. This is where we look at it and you know, start doing surgery. And from that perspective, you can think about this reduction as you know, a very weak regularity lemma for a set of points. Right? Regularity lemmas are basically the statements of the sort of you can take any worst case object, do certain kind of surgery on it, and reduce to average case situation. Structure. Okay? So, so this is, these are the two components. So let me start with, a, I mean, we'll spend most of the time on, on this second component. Um, so the first component is, you know, showing that average case has nice structure. This, is, uh, this, is, uh, this was the contribution of the first paper. Um, and uh, here, is, uh, here is how it looks, uh, looks like. So think about, I mean, so the average case will be now in Euclidean space. I mean, it, it, it doesn't really matter if it is in Hamming space or Euclidean space. It turns out that if you do algorithms in Euclidean space, they also imply algorithms in Hamming space. And the actual algorithm, the actual reduction is much more naturally fought in Euclidean space as opposed to in Hamming space. So Euclidean space now. Um, so think about the uh, data set as essentially being random point set on a sphere. Uh, which basically means that all the vectors are pretty much perpendicular to each other. You know, in high dimensional geometry, random vectors are usually perpendicular to each other. And also, we want that two random points are roughly a distance CR. So, this is the far distance, right? We're saying that if we take a query point, let's say, in any random point on the sphere, this point is roughly at the limit of the far distance. Okay, so pictorially, we have this sphere. We pick two random points, let, you know, there will be perpendicular vectors. There are distance CR, which basically means that you know, they are random on a sphere of a certain radius. This radius is CR by root 2. 
So the lemma uh, proven in that paper is that for this case, we can get rho which is better. OK, this is this improved rho that we're, we're getting. OK? And uh, the construction is uh, basically something we call cap carving. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's related to some, uh, some methods introduced uh, in 90s by Kargir, Matwani, and Sudan. I should have put a citation here. Uh, and also used in the other paper with Piotr Indik in 2006 for getting, uh, for getting better uh, partitions for Euclidean space. So here, this is a partition of, of the surface of the sphere. And uh, the way it works is the following. So you basically pick a distance from the center to the hyperplane, and then you basically cut out the, the cap of the sphere. Okay? And you proceed so by picking these random caps until you have covered the entire sphere. Now these caps intersect, so you take precedence. Basically, the first, caps, the first cap wins the point, basically. OK, it's shown by picture. And um, um, I won't describe why this obtains better exponent than the general Euclidean space, but it seems to have to do something with the curvature of the space, basically. Um, but in some sense, the distance on the sphere is, is bigger than the, distance, the direct distance between two points. Um, OK, so this is, this is the, the space partition. And now we'll go into the reduction, actually. Are there questions about that so far? Sorry, so this is just one hash function, right? This is one hash function. The random choice is uh, the directions of these caps. OK? And you, know, you, choose, you, you can compute probability p1 of collision of close points, probability p2 of uh, collision of far points, basically points which are uh, in this configuration, and then rho is a function of p1 and p2, and this is the formula that we get. Okay, so uh, so this is the average case, basically. <coughs> so now the statement is that you can reduce any worst case point set to this average case point set. Okay, and how does the reduction go? So we'll have a running example here of point set. Uh, so think about this as we, ha we start with some point set which lies in a ball of larger radius and has perhaps no structure. Uh, and say, let's, ra let's say radius is by you know, 100 times more than it should be, 100 CR. Uh, so the basic idea will be to iteratively to do certain kind of surgery, but we'll, we'll see in a second. And the idea is to reduce the uh, radius of the minimum closing ball. Okay, we'll reduce this until we we'll reduce until we get to this radius roughly CR by root two, and then it will basically be easy to seal off the deal. Okay. So the main step of the kind of of, of this surgery, I guess, is uh, identifying dense clusters. Okay. So this is kind of similar to the lower bound, where say like there is a tight ball which contains a lot of points, and it is much smaller than the point set. This is what we'll be doing. Basically, we'll find a dense cluster. The dense cluster means something that has smaller radius, has progress on radius, but still contains a large fraction of points. We'll parameterize this a little bit later, but this is just pictorial at the moment. We'll extract these dense clusters. We'll recurse on them, on the dense clusters, but then we also have to deal with these remaining point set, with this basically no dense cluster point set. So what we'll do here, actually, we'll just apply cap carving as is on this sparse point set here. So it means that we will draw a few caps. We'll partition the points uh, a little bit on, uh, on, the, on the surface of the sphere. This partitions the points in a few more parts, and we'll recurse on all these parts. Basically, we'll recurse both on dense clusters and on each of these caps. Okay. Um, so this means that, for example, here we might find new dense clusters on which we'll recurse and so forth. Okay. So the general structure, so this is, think about this as kind of this algorithm will replace one hash table, okay? And in particular this, uh, okay, uh, let's hold on that thought. But um, let me uh, explain why can we apply car cap carving on the rest, okay? Why, why is it okay to apply cap carving on this big sparse point set? 
Okay? In some sense, this is exactly the reason why we extracted the dense clusters. Okay? So the way we extracted the dense clusters will ensure that the remaining point set basically looks like this average case point set in a much bigger ball, which essentially means that the average points, the average interpoint distance, they are still roughly perpendicular to each other, but the distance is even larger than, than we hoped for. This is like solving nearest neighbor search for much larger approximation, which, is, which means that it's just a simpler problem. Okay, so curb carving works even better than, as if, than for approximation C. Okay, the main point being here is that the remaining, the sparse kind of remaining point set looks essentially like a random or average case data set. Okay, so the, the hash function, uh, again, kind of for, uh, the hash function is basically can be described by a tree. Um, it replaces the hash table. And, uh, you know, it looks the following, you know, your entire point set will correspond to the root, let's say this gray. You identify some dense clusters, you extract them. Uh, this will correspond to having two children, one corresponding to the dense clusters, one corresponding to the no dense cluster sets. Now, these dense cluster sets are partitioned further down with cap carving, uh, basically in a few caps. This means that you partition the point set further. And then perhaps you recurse on all these colored parts. You find more dense clusters, you extract them, you recurse. Okay. So this is the high level uh, perspective. Um, and now we'll, I'll describe a little bit more in, in detail how we find these dense clusters and what they mean. Okay. So, so dense clusters. Um, okay. So. So the current data set uh, has radius r, right? Um, so a dense cluster will be a dense cl uh, a cluster that contains n to one minus delta points. So delta will be a parameter that we'll fix later, okay? And uh, when the following property: so the dense we want we essentially do we extract points that violate directly what it means to be average case. Basically, pseudorandom. Basically, this means that a dense cluster means that we find a point on the surface of the sphere such that there are many points which are a little bit less than being perpendicular from us. Right. So all the points, all the points that are basically here, perpendicular here, will be a distance roughly root two times the radius. So we're saying that if there is a ball of radius root two minus epsilon for a small epsilon that contains many points, where many points means n to minus 1 minus epsilon, we will extract all the points on the surface of the sphere. This will be our dense cluster. Okay. Now, this ball, this red ball, has a radius much larger than what we started with. Right? This red ball has radius which is roughly root 2 times r, as opposed to we are trying to reduce the radius of the ball. But the cool part is that what we really care is that the surface of the sphere and the surface of the sphere can be inscribed, basically the surface of this sphere, intersection of this red, red ball, can be inscribed in this purple ball, which has radius, which has smaller radius. It has radius something like one minus omega epsilon squared r. So this blue ball will be our dense cluster. This is the ball that uh, has progress on the, uh, on the radius. Now, after we remove all clusters, basically, we just look for all the points that contain very many points within this red ball kind of radius, like roughly root 2 minus epsilon times r. We inscribe in a smaller ball. We extract them as much as we can until we find no more balls. This means that after we have done this, for any point on the surface, there are at most n to 1 minus delta points within distance root 2 minus epsilon. So you can think of. I mean, this is, I mean, this is some kind of progress towards where we want to be, namely that all the points are essentially perpendicular or orthogonal to each other, except for certain kind of impurity, uh, which has magnitude n to 1 minus delta. Okay. So, and the other points are essentially orthogonal. Now, we are, we'll be applying for this after we removed all clusters on the remaining points that we're applying the cap carving with some parameters p1 and p2. P1 is the probability of collision of close points, and P2 is probability of collision of far points. So in some sense, what we need to look at is, is the empirical number of points 
uh, that remain in, in a particular uh, chunk, in a particular bu bucket, um, corresponding to the query, let's say. So the empirical number of far points uh, will be n times p2, kind of. This comes from the cap carving. It says, uh, for all the points that are essentially orthogonal, the probability of collision is p2. Now, this doesn't hold for, probab for points which are with impurity, because they must, can be much closer. And then the uh, cap carving doesn't apply to them. But you know, they're at most n to 1 minus delta of them. Right? So this is, in some sense, the impurity of this. So as long as basically this term is much larger than this one, the impurity is a small term, basically. It doesn't matter that much. Okay. Yes, Jerry? If you remove the dense cluster, you had a set of points that are essentially random, and therefore you could do cap carving, right? Mm -hmm. So inside the dense clusters, we have no structure. No, you're recursing on the dense clusters, but I thought you said also on the caps, you're going to find dense clusters. Uh, right, right. So in a sense, think about this. This impurity is good at this level. But then we partition a little bit with cap carving, this means that the number of points gets much closer to this bound. So now something that wasn't dense cluster before suddenly begins to be a dense cluster. Basically, this imp I mean, so there is some kind of impurity of a point set, and it is just a little bit less than polynomial, uh, than, sorry, than linear in N. Okay? So when you start partitioning a point set, at some moment, as you go through, through, the, through the tree, each node of the tree will kind of contain a part of a data set, and it shrinks. Now that impurity starts to be pro proportional or kind of, of roughly the same magnitude as we know of the data set size there. So then this impurity begins to matter. So this is why, in some sense, think about this, re this recursion will start looking at the impurity. Great. I mean, if the points were to be completely perpendicular, like all of them, then yes, we can just do cap carving and solve there. But there is this impurity to deal with. So in a sense, this is kind of, you know, it is not a pure reduction, right? I mean, it uh, interlaces the steps of kind of faster algorithm for average case and the reduction to average case. OK, so there are a few kind of, you know, once there are parameters, it's kind of good to understand what is the trade-off of these parameters. Why can't we push either epsilon or delta to, you know, 0 or 1? So let's look at epsilon. So the epsilon is trade-off between two things. One is the smaller radius, how much progress we make on the radius. We want this epsilon to be not too small. And the other part is the notion of essentially orthogonal. That if we make epsilon to be too large, then this means we are further and further away from basically being nearly orthogonal. And then things begin to degrade. Right? We are not exactly as promised orthogonal. Um, OK, so this is epsilon. Now, delta uh, is a trade-off between well, basically, this formula that you know, which wants delta to be as high as possible, all right? And the other one we'll see on the next slide. Okay. All right. So just to recap how this looks like, so we have a tree, and um, basically during a query, what happens is that we'll recurse, we'll we'll recurse in all clusters, and in one bucket in cap carving. So when you have a query, so pictorially, when you have a query, you don't really know whether in your neighbor is one of the dense clusters or it is in the remaining part. So you have to go in all of them. Okay. Now, once you are in cap carving part, now this is this functions as a real standard hash function. So you just go into one part. So there is a certain uh, amount of branching happening, which depends on the number of these dense clusters. Okay. Particularly, we're looking more than one leaf. So how much branching happens? So the claim is that the number of uh, the amount of branching, basically, the number of leaves we'll look at is essentially n to power delta plus 1 to some power which depends on epsilon. And here is the proof. So each time we branch, this means that there are at most n to power delta clusters. This was the reason why we wanted clusters to be relatively heavy, so that there are not too many, plus 1 from the sparse part. And, uh, the good part is that each time we branch, the cluster reduces radius by at least an epsilon squared. So 
since there are, we started with radius, which is like 100 CR, there are basically only 100 by epsilon squared steps that you can do with this branching, and hence we claim. Okay? So basically, this is the other part of the trade off. This is why we don't want to make delta to be too large. Um, okay, how much more time do I have? 12 to hour. <laughs> okay. okay, no, so um, we're in essentially done. So progress happens in two ways here. Maybe. So one is that the clusters, when we remove the clusters and recursing clusters, the clusters reduce the radius. Okay. Whereas the cap carving, you know, kind of when we go into this side, the progress that happens is that these, this hash function basically partitions the points and basically each part reduces a lot the number of points in the part. Okay. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you'll prove that this tree succeeds in finding the closest pair with probability n to essentially rho minus mole of 1, where this rho is 1 over 2c squared minus 1. Okay? So you will have to repeat this many times to, to get a constant probability of finding your near neighbor. Okay. So, yeah, so one, um, I guess, one question what pops up is, you know, how do we do this dense cluster finding uh, efficiently? So this is pre-processing. You know, you might or might not care about pre-processing. In case you do, you can do it fast, okay? And here is the reason. Um, uh, so step number one is that you can actually, you know, step number one is that you can reduce the time to find dense clusters to quadratic time. So originally it is not clear how to do it even in polynomial time because you have to remove such clusters for any point on the, on the surface of the sphere. Okay. So it turns out that with some loss of parameters, it is enough to consider centers that are data set points. Okay. So you can just consider this for each data set point. So that's step one. Step two is that you can actually reduce it to near linear time from here, mostly because you can do downsampling your clusters are heavy objects. They contain a lot of points, so if you don't sample the big structure, you can still see it and can still extract it. That's the intuition. Okay. All right, so I'm essentially out of time. Um, so there are many more details, actually. Uh, there is a lot of things that have been uh, swept under the carpet. Uh, in particular, that you have to work with empirical estimates um, of P2 uh, just because of, of, of the data dependency, which begins to be delicate because you, you have to condition on certain events. In particular, in particular, you have to, you can ignore all this, I guess, go straight here. You have to do LSH analysis of colli basically collision of points for three points, right, which is kind of different from what has been happening before. Um, so this is part one. Part two is that in dense clusters, uh, I don't know if some of you noticed that those that purple ball is not centered. Its, its surface does not correspond to the surface of the original sphere, which means that some points move inside. And this begins to be trouble. So then you have to do, um, I mean, cap carving works for points on this sphere surface only. So then you have to do more partitioning of the ball into thin shells and records on the shells. Um, and so forth. Anyways, uh, just saying that there are more details. Okay, and uh, this actually finishes my talk. So let me just conclude. Um, so the main kind of message is that you can do, uh, you can go beyond LSH bounds and uh, get better nearest neighbor search using data dependent hashing. In particular, what I have shown you uh, is a reduction from worst case to average case uh, point set. And this implies a nearest neighbor search with query time, which is uh, uh, n to power rho for this rho, for this improved rho, for the Euclidean space. Uh, so going forward, kind of, you know, what are the natural questions to be asked? One is, can we get even better bounds here? Okay, so there are, you know, good news and bad news. The good news is that for dimension, which is proportional to log n, you can get better rho. You can get rho, which is better than this one. Okay, so this is... Uh, upcoming paper in SODA by uh, Thijs Leierhoven. Uh, so this is, I mean, in some sense, I want to contrast it with the situation for closest pair, where basically the paper by Alman and Williams showed that if your dimension is proportional to log n, you can get truly subquadratic time. 
So for dimension which is bigger than log n, let's say for dimension bigger than log n to power 1 plus delta, uh, in joint work with Ilya Rosenstein, uh, we proved that this row is optimal for data dependent hashing. Okay? Now, you have to formalize what it means to be optimal in this situation because you have to rule out the Verona diagram. And the way we formalize it, we restrict the description complexity of the hash function to be sublinear. Basically, you can't remember all the points. Okay, so even if you do Voron diagram on root n points, this is the best bound that you can get. Okay, another very good question uh, that we thought for a bit was whether you can do better reduction and apply these kind of reductions for other settings where you have better algorithms for average case, but not for worst case. Uh, so this reduction at the moment works for nearest neighbor search only. Another kind of, uh, another perspective or another question is kind of more on the algorithmic side is uh, to contrast it with uh, nearest neighbor search for L infinity. Uh, in particular, uh, back in 1998, Petrindic showed that you can, for L infinity metric, you can get approximation which is log log D with polynomial space and sublinear query time. And uh, the nice part was the deterministic decision tree. Okay. So, you know, there is a natural question, you know, can we get better approximation? Turns out that at least for this model, basically for these uh, decision trees, uh, even for randomized ones, there are matching lower bounds of order log log D. Um, and uh, so Cliff mentioned previous talk that uh, uh, every other talk mentions uh, Mihai Patrashko's name. Uh, so this is refuting a little bit. This will also mention kind of uh, Mihai's uh, uh, work. So this is joint work with Doreen Kreitoro and Mihai Patrashko, and uh, later on kind of uh, extension to the randomized case was by uh, Mikhail Kapralov and Rina Panigrafi. Um, so the cool part, okay, kind of connecting back to what we're talking about is that this algorithm can now be thought as data-dependent hashing. So in some sense it puts this nearest neighbor search for different metrics under the same umbrella. And it leads to the question of can we now use, say, data-dependent hashing or these kind of techniques for designing nearest neighbor search under any norm. For example, some of the you know, cool norms that I, I'd be happy to think about is matrix norms, say, spectral norm, or f over distance. Okay, so I'm done here, but I'll just kind of, you know, my conclusions, you know, from this work and from other, uh, from other works that we have been working on is that my perspective on our bounds is that this is an opportunity to discover new algorithmic techniques. And I'll end here. Thank you. Any questions for Alex? Oh, here's a question, Paul. Yeah. yeah so, uh, for so this works when you're doing the the linear, uh, you know, end of the one plus delta type time or whatever for. Uh, to build your hash table given the set. Right. What, um, is there anything that you can do in terms of updates compared to, like LSH, it might be a little easier with respect to updates. Yeah, great question. So basically, can we make this data structure dynamic? Great question, right? It, it is not obvious why it should be possible because if your hash functions, if your space partitions depend on the data set, as you change the data set, your hash functions may become completely unusable. So it turns out that you can use uh, essentially standard dynamization techniques to make this dynamic, um, kind of nothing fancy going on, kind of you know you'll you'll do visual techniques. It can make it can be made dynamic, like not even amortized, kind of in a real sense. Oh, question. Sorry. Right. So your algorithm seems to have a lot of the structure of like hierarchical k-means. Mm -hmm. um, in practice, they seem to get similar results. And so, right. if so, can you actually use it to get a a faster version of how it means? Great question. Uh, I mean, Ilya and we were trying to think about this, and Ilya was trying to write some experiments, actually, so it's a great question, yes. We don't know yet the answer, but it's the right question to ask, yeah.